things off, if that sounds okay. Um, with, a, with a hearty welcome, welcome everybody and, um, and happy Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, I've, I've missed attending the colloque the last few weeks, so it's, it's wonderful to be back. Angie and I have been in, um, in search committee mode, so apologies for having to miss the last few fantastic events. From what I've heard, I know they've gone extremely well, um, and today I'm sure will be no exception to that. Just a couple of really quick announcements. Uh, if I might. So first, uh, just as a quick reminder, on October 15th is our is our closing date for applications um, for our Commons program um, director as well as new faculty hire for IU. So um, for anybody on the line, if you have questions, of course, feel free to reach out to anybody on the search committee, Edu and myself, um, you know, co-chairing, but otherwise, um, help us get the word out because uh, we're looking forward to having a hopefully a very deep and diverse pool uh, for that uh, for that position to consider. Um, also, remember this whole week is the is the wonderful IESC Global Conference. Um, Inza and Mike McGinnis and Emily Castle and myself are on a panel at 1:45 today. Um, if I'm not mistaken, to talk both about the workshop and IESC um, and collaborations between the two historically and looking ahead to then it's going to be a really, really nice discussion. I look forward to that. Hope you can join. And I remember as well, uh, in part because of the IESC happening this week with so many jam-packed events, we're not doing a regular research series event. So um, don't tune in here Wednesday at noon. There's plenty of other things to tune into at that same time. We will be reconvening uh, starting next Wednesday for the research series. Uh, but today, we're uh, very, very excited uh, to have a great discussion here. And uh, Jamie well, kindly uh, uh, in, uh, nominated, basically, you are for this, for this role. So thank you, Jamie, uh, for kicking us off and introducing our distinguished speaker. And then um, after uh, our, your opening remarks, Angie is going to be uh, moderating the discussion. So welcome, everybody. Thanks again for taking the time. And, and Jamie, without further ado, um, over to you. Great. Thank you, Scott. Well, it is my pleasure to introduce um, Art Cardin, or Dr. Cardin, should I say. Um, Art is a professor of economics at Sanford University. Um, and uh, hold on a sec, I'm pulling up the name of his chair. Okay. He's a professor of economics and business, or at the Sanford University's Brock School of Business. Um, and is also a senior fellow with the American Institute for Economic Research and the Fraser Institute, and um, a research fellow at many other wonderful distinguished institutions. Um, Art has published prolifically, and that's how I got to know him first, through his writing um, for Forbes and other, um, and he, other um, publications. So. Um, and I found art to be really inventive, really creative, fun um, scholar to read, and uh, very thoughtful as well. And so I know that you'll enjoy hearing his talk as, as much as I'm looking forward to it. Um, art and I did meet last summer at the American Institute for Economic Research, and he just keeps pulling me further along into political economy as if I needed any help. <laughs> um, no, but um, an arts talk today is on a book chapter or is on a book project that I've been hearing about for the last year on the economist William A. H. Hutt, who um, was a longtime professor at um, Univer <laughs> University of Cape Town in South Africa, dealt with a lot of important issues on political economy, um, economics, the, pushing it back against um, the, the color bar. And so Art is going to be um, sharing with us more about that. So without further ado, please welcome Mark Hardin. Okay, thank you all very much. I'm going to go ahead and click the uh, click the screen share here, and everybody should be able to see the PowerPoint slides now. A um, couple of couple of quick points. As I as I mentioned earlier, this is my second visit to uh, to the workshop at IU back in early 2010. Not long after Dr. Ostrom won the Nobel Prize, um, I got to visit and present a paper on um, the Memphis race riot of 1866. And you might see on the on the, the first slide here the you know, much younger, much thinner me uh, standing there with, with Dr. Ostrom and what, what frankly was one of the highlights of uh, my intellectual life. And this paper, so this paper we're getting ready to send probably to public choice. And it's part of a larger book project that we're working on related again to W.H. Hutt and his critique of the color bar. The paper specifically is brought to you by a few things. First of all, it's brought to you by the American Institute for Economic Research and their visiting research fellowship program. I know that they're probably a few graduate students in the room or a few untenured faculty members in the room. And uh, the Harwood Visiting Research Fellowship at AIER is fantastic. Uh, 
Um, it created the space between where Jamie's office was and where my office was next to my co-author Phil Magnus's office and many, many discussions led to uh, our paper, Jamie's and my paper, The Goodness of Tolerance and Humanity of Political Economy that appeared in Faith and Economics last year. And then a paper that we are working on right now about discussion among natural equals that I'll present at the Southern Economic Association um, uh, toward the end of next month. But the subject of the paper is W.H. Hutt, his notion of consumer sovereignty and his critique of the color bar in South Africa. The origin story for the paper goes back to about 2017 when uh, a historian at Duke University named Nancy McLean published a book called Democracy and Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Right Stealth Plan for America. And that was part of a cluster of books that appeared right around the same time that uh, at the time we said, well, that made James M. Buchanan the official recently deceased Nobel laureate of the age of Trump. And one of the claims that McLean made and one of the claims that a lot of other intellectual historians made was that public choice economics was birthed as, as part of this sort of unholy marriage between segregationism uh, and a reaction to Brown versus Board of Education. And I remember reading this and thinking, well, that's a, that's a very, very strange play on the part of Buchanan and the scholars at the University of Virginia, given that in the mid 1960s, they hosted this economist, William Harold Hutt. And Hutt, in the middle of the 50s, had had his passport suspended for the South from the, by the South African government, in part due to his critique of apartheid. In 1964, Hutt publishes with the Institute of Economic Affairs this book called The Economics of the Color Bar, which is a searing indictment of the institutions and political economy of the racist state. Um, it occurs to me parenthetically that it's appropriate to be presenting this on Indigenous Peoples Day, given that you know, Hutt's whole program around this time is, is, is about exactly that, that issue. Um, and then Hutt visited the University of Virginia in 1965 and 1966. So, we found that puzzling. We thought that was a, that was a strange play, if McLean's thesis was correct. Um, and we kind of brought this up. But some other people, a Quint Slobodian, another intellectual historian, argued that Hutt was problematic or questionable because in the 1960s, in particular, he opposed the idea, the doctrine of one man, one vote, and instead endorsed a qualified franchise or um, some way of gradually expanding the franchise in South Africa and Rhodesia as a means, he argued, of a much more peaceful um, transition away from and out of the oppressive apartheid regime and into, um, into something more democratic, more democratic and something more representative. So that began our investigation of Hutt himself, Hutt specifically, the, the color bar, which we variously spell with a U and without a U, and the political economy of post-colonial Africa. And we discovered in doing all of this, you know, that, that Hutt has, Hutt is, is a complex and interesting character. We teach in introductory economics classes about consumer sovereignty, and, and Hutt is the guy who, who introduced the term, or at least popularized the term, within economics. And he argued, basically, that in a, in a market economy, the producers dance to the tune that's played by the consumers, who, by their buying and selling, decide, basically, what's going to be produced, when it's going to be produced, where it's going to be produced, how and for whom. And we think that this, this ends up being a much more interesting idea or a much more interesting, much richer concept, we think, than simply saying, you know, consumers are great and they decide what gets, they are the ones who decide what gets produced. In the broader context of Hutt's work and in the broader context of economic ideas as they developed in the 20th century, we think there's a lot of, a lot of fruit to be picked looking at how his ideas about consumer sovereignty interact with his ideas about how labor markets work, with his ideas about the color bar specifically, and with kind of how we understand right now the relationships between colonized and colonizing peoples. Hunt's writing career really got off to uh, a start with the publication of his first book, The Theory of Collective Bargaining, which he would revisit later as um, in another book called The Strike Threat System. And in it, he referred to, um, this, is, this is where he begins to make his first real criticisms of trade unionism as it's being practiced in South Africa and elsewhere. 
Okay, he notes, of course, you got the standard story that, um, uh, again, you know, you, you hear, you, you know, from reading labor history that you had the exploited workers that so they all banded together. And then they, they rose up and they got great wages and working conditions. And if you like your weekends, thank the unions or, or, or whatever it is. Um, Hutt argues that the story, the real story is a little bit more, um, is a little bit more uh, sophisticated than that. And it's more a story not of people banding to, it, it's not a story of class warfare where people are banding together to throw off the chains of the oppressors. It's rather a much more straightforward story of rent creation, rent extraction, and rent appropriation. Um, <clears throat> obviously, labor regulation or labor market regulation, as, as we would learn later from reading George Stigler, is at least one way to create economic rents. And Hutt argues that collective bargaining is, or the institutions of collective bargaining are exactly that. They exist for the purposes of, um, of creating economic rents, and he refers to the strike threat as, quote, an intolerable abuse of economic freedom. Because he argues under the, the institutions of collective bargaining as they exist at the time, um, <clears throat> the strike threat, the strike threat he argued was it was a type of private coercion. Because the strikers presumably couldn't be fired, they could be, um, they could shut down production and they can impose fairly substantial losses on uh, their employers, fairly substantial losses on customers, fairly substantial losses kind of across the economic board. Now then, in theory of collective bargaining and elsewhere, Hutt would argue that, um, Hutt would argue that, correct what am I saying here? Hutt would argue that, uh, correct you, explo <laughs> exploitation anticipated, excuse me, is necessarily going to be exploitation avoided. So exploitation anticipated is going to be exploitation avoided because you know any any firm that can anticipate or rationally or reasonably anticipate um, large scale collective bargaining can pick a more capital intensive production process or find some way to avoid this. He argued that the uh, that the extractions and the expropriations that happened as a result of collective bargaining came at the expense not of capital but at the expense of customers who had to pay higher prices for stuff and at the expense of people who were effectively pushed out of the labor market, okay? So in the case of South Africa, it was um, the, the increases in incomes that accrued to unionized white workers came at the expense of primarily indigenous workers and customers who would have been buying their products. Hutt's most famous, again, for introducing this term consumer sovereignty, which appears in his book, Economist and the Public, A Study of Competition and Opinion. And he argues that, uh, he, ar excuse me, he argues that the consumer is sovereign when in his role of citizen, he is not delegated to political institutions for authoritarian use, the power which he can exercise socially through his power to demand or to refrain from demanding. Um, even though he's writing, I think about nine years before Hayek published The Use of Knowledge in Society, nonetheless, he is, he's emphasizing the information processing and information transmitting roles of profits, losses, and prices. His argument about consumer sovereignty effectively says that the decision about what to produce, where to produce it, when to produce it, et cetera, is determined by what Raymond Tallis would, would much later in the 20th century call trillions of cognitive handshakes, where again, people through their power to demand or to refrain from demanding, vote on what's gonna be produced, who's gonna be produced, who's gonna produce it, when, where, why, and how. In other words, production takes place as a process of cooperation in a well-functioning market economy, as opposed to being a process of uh, top-down planning, coercion, and administration. He writes, again further, quote, competitive institutions satisfy the criterion of enabling the maximization of consumer sovereignty. If not frustrated, competition leads to an impersonal control of the distribution of all productive resources, human or other, in accordance with the community's demands. Okay, so he's arguing that that uh, that consumer and, and consumer sovereignty becomes his normative criterion over the course of the remainder of, uh, of his work. 
And the fact that he's using the plural possessive here, I think is, is important because sometimes you might see this referred to just as consumer sovereignty or consumer apostrophe S sovereignty. The way the HUD's using it as a plural possessive um, suggests again that this, this is a, a broad social process. This is a conversation that's happening. This again is the process of what Raymond or is the product of what Talis would like to call these trillions of cognitive handshakes. So Hunt argues in favor of consumer sovereignty as sort of a normative criterion. He argues for competitive institutions because they satisfy the criterion of enabling the maximization of consumer sovereignty. And uh, he argues, he'll, he'll argue later that consumer sovereignty is in a lot of ways at odds with the goals of the South African apartheid state. Because as he says, most consumers and the marginal consumer doesn't really don't care or doesn't really care about who's making the goods that they're that they're they're buying. Doesn't really care that much about their race, color, or creed. Um, they just care about whether they're getting a good deal or not. And the apartheid state that Hunt critiques is in a lot of ways an effort to um, circumvent competitive institutions and veto the outcomes of consumers making sovereign decisions. Where this gets interesting, or, or one of the places where we think this, this gets especially interesting is in some of the work that Hutt would later do on institutional change in the face of a crisis. In the 1940s, he wrote this book, A Plan for Reconstruction. And in, in, a, in a lot of ways, Hutt was, was somewhat idealistic. And he basically said, here's how, here's how the British Here's how, here's how Britain can effectively reconstitute itself after World War II in a manner that's going to be consistent with long-run economic growth and in a manner that's going to be consistent with his, his normative principle of consumer sovereignty. We see in Plan for Reconstruction the seeds of the argument that Hunt's going to make about 20 years later about um, popular sovereignty and one man, one vote in the later part of, in uh, post-colonial Africa. Because he argues, again, as Mansur Olson would later, that political outcomes are basically the, the large, they're basically the, the, the product of bargaining between interest groups you know, and these, these development of coalitions. And the coalitions are the ones that ultimately get the public policies that they either want or are, are willing to accept. And very importantly, um, HUD in Plan for Reconstruction emphasizes the importance of compromise as kind of a pragmatic or practical, practical alternative to idealism. So there's a claim again that's being made by intellectual historians of, of late 20th century Montpelier and neoliberalism that Hutt is arguing for restrictions on the franchise because he's a white supremacist, or he's arguing for restrictions on the franchise because um, you know, he just doesn't trust democracy or, or something like that. Um, the actual case is, is, I think, much more sophisticated. Hutt knows and argues that political outcomes are the, pro are the product of interest group bargaining. And he argues furthermore that property rights are effectively kind of a stewardship that we have of the social well and the social resources. The extent to which we steward those well or wisely is, again, going to be determined by the institutions that people face. And he, he argues strictly practically, he argues strictly practically as a means, he, he argues strictly practically that the way we want to, um, uh, the way that we should, the way that we should think about compromise and institutional change in the face of crisis is to think in terms of, again, the kinds of the bargains that might be accepted. He argues that um, it would be good, well, it, it would be acceptable for, uh, the British populace around the time that they're doing all of this work or around the, around the time of World War II to accept some, some things that may not be ideal in order to serve this larger good of getting longer run economic growth and better institutions more consistent with consumer sovereignty. In the late, tw or in, uh, about 20 years after this, in looking at post-colonial Africa, they'll make a very, very similar, very, very similar argument saying that it is uh, in a lot of ways inconsistent with any reasonable theory of human rights that we would limit the franchise. But as, as he argues in looking at post-colonial African, uh, African transition, 
There are potentially very, 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 very serious problems associated with the move to uh, one man, one vote. In the early part of the 20th century, or sorry, in, in, the, in the 1960s, he is studying race and democratization in post-colonial Southern Africa and looking very specifically at transitions that are happening around South Africa and around Rhodesia. Okay, so Rhodesia, which would eventually become Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, which will declare its independence unilaterally on November 11th of 1965, and uh, effectively earn the ire of the entire international community, <clears throat> Hunt argues, and, and sort of kind of out of, out of step to a certain extent with, with at least some public opinion, he, Hunt argues that the, the standard stories people are telling about post-colonial transition being sort of strictly oppressive or strictly racist are not accurate insofar as places like Rhodesia, places like South Africa, face the very, very real problem, face the very, very real problem of trying to come up with um, institutional solutions that make genuinely multi-ethnic, genuinely multiracial uh, democratic societies possible. Hunt argues, and Hunt emphasizes as he's doing, as he's doing all of this, the insights and the work of Alexis de Tocqueville and John Stuart Mill. Specifically, he argues what he calls the Tocqueville principle. And effectively says that what is required if post-colonial transition in South Africa or post-colonial transition in Africa generally is going to be successful, it's going to be adherence to what he calls the Tocqueville principle, specifically that majorities cannot and should not be able to enrich themselves at the expense of minorities. His argument or his, his skepticism about transition to one man, one vote is the possibility or indeed even the probability, the likelihood of demagogues stepping in and effectively overturning what liberal institutions might remain in Africa and um, despoiling African whites to the short run benefit of African blacks and to the long run detriment of everybody. This is interesting in part because in 1961, and this is some of the stuff that, that Jamie and I are studying, um, a theologian and activist named Z.K. Matthews gives the T.B. Davey lecture on academic freedom at the University of Cape Town. And in the correspondence between Matthews and Hutt, we see Hutt arguing for what he calls ironclad constitutional provisions. And he says, effectively, as a matter of practical politics, it's very, very unlikely that, um, that South African whites are going to see power unless they have at least some, what he calls ironclad constitutional provisions of the existing distribution of rights. Whether the existing distribution of rights is, um, is just or not, Hutt thinks is of secondary consideration to the question of whether or not they are efficient and whether they can move through something more efficient if people are willing to accept um, you know, a bargain that, that, again, we kind of would have to hold our nose and say, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll, we'll accept that uh, this unjustly gotten property can remain, but go, go, gadget coast theorem, we're going to move forward and have longer run economic growth. He argues very specifically that the cry for self-determination does not solve the problems of government. He thinks, in other words, that democracy, mere democratization, and the move to one man, one vote is not going to solve any of the, or it's not going to solve all the problems, obviously, of Southern Africa, and indeed will probably create uh, many, many, many more. Okay. In his articles and public speeches, he makes this very, very clear, and he does so repeatedly. And in some sense, he's kind of vindicated a little bit by uh, the eventual rise of Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe and some of the other, some of the depredations of majoritarian populism as they happen in different regions of Southern Africa. This fate would happen in the 1990s, unfortunately. So about 10 years or so after, uh, after Hutt passed away, um, we had a, something of a, a, of a miraculous transition of the sort in South Africa with the, uh, with the movement, with, with the post-apartheid movement. I'm really not sure that um, Hutt could have anticipated the influence of uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the willingness to reconcile of Nelson Mandela in the post-communist world that South Africa inhabited. <clears throat> But um, 
to make a long story short, thank you, Hutt's argument is, uh, Hutt's argument for restrictions on the franchise is not due to any sort of racial animus or any sort of colonial imperative. Rather, it's due to a lot of the things that we take, uh, that we sort of take for granted in mainstream public choice and political science. Okay, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Well, thank you, Art. That is such a fascinating overview of um, a really rich topic. I know I have lots of mm -hmm. questions. I'm not first in the queue, though, um, and I do okay. have the rare honor of mod moderating. So, so I just want to invite anyone who has questions to go ahead and either raise their hand, um, and I will make sure that I maybe Art, if you could end your screen and end the share screen, oh, and that sure. way we can see everybody. And then, so you can either raise your hand. Okay. Either, yeah, with the with the raise hand function or put your question in the, you know, just let me know in the chat if you have a question. So I see Salih and then Dean is next. So Salih, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Art, uh, for a very informative paper and presentation uh, for introducing us to HUT. Um, I learned a lot from uh, both your paper and presentation. So okay. you, 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 you note that, you know, according to Hutt, every repression of the Africans has at the same time been a repression of the free market. So this connection mm -hmm. between free market, slavery and repression, to me, it seems like a, a context very specific to uh, South Africa, where right. uh, white mon minority came to the land and dominated the resources, then exploited the labor. However, mm -hmm. when we look at the broader dynamics with slavery, particularly with slavery or disenfranchisement, uh, the market's mm -hmm. role is, can we conceptualize market's role to be the same? Or, you know, one could argue that, you know, free market, depending on people's preferences, preferences of uh, <coughs> landowners, I don't know, uh, mm -hmm. farm owners, could, could motivate them to engage in, uh, Intercontinent, uh, intercontinental slave trade, for instance. So mm -hmm. I wanted to get your opinion about, you know, uh, within the broader perspective, you know, perhaps yeah. looking yeah. also to the Americas, uh, how would you mm -hmm. conceptualize the link between the free market and the slave trade? Thank you very much. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a fascinating question. Um, yeah, so, so the relationship between the free market and the slave trade is, is, is very interesting insofar as sort of this, there's no the slave trade. There's, 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 a, there's a Trans-Saharan slave trade, the Trans-Indian Ocean slave trade, and a Trans-Atlantic slave trade, and many, 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 uh, <clears throat> many slave trades. My, I, I, I've not actually seen Hunt make this claim uh, because I actually don't know that he writes much about slavery. Uh, I'd have to have to, to, to look again, but that seems sort of like, like one of the ultimate um, sort of abrogations of, individual dignity and possibly one could say consumer sovereignty that uh, people are being forced to do something they, ne they they wouldn't otherwise necessarily do. With respect to the big institutional questions, there are a few things going on here. First, Hutt does argue, and I think this is, um, there's a lot of fertile, fertile ground to be tilled here, that the right analogy for South African uh, indigenous people or for South African Africans is not Blacks in the United States, not Blacks in the Americas, but rather indigenous Native, indigenous Native Americans in the United States. And I think that's, that he argues is, is a much, much closer analogy, I think, because you don't have necessarily chattel slavery and an international slave trade uh, going on, going on in, in the, the 19th and 20th centuries. But you do have a lot of rules and a lot of legislation, like the Group Areas Act and things like that, that are, are that sort of closely resemble the way that in the United States, again, for example, we, we regulated the lives of, of Native Americans. So <clears throat> um, trying to think of how to put this in sort of the broader, the broader sweep of colonial, uh, colonial history. Um, whether or not it's unique to Southern Africa, that, that's, that's an issue where I, I just need to do some more reading. And uh, if you have any suggestions on, uh, on institutional evolution in the rest of Africa, I'd be, be more than happy to hear that, or more than happy to, uh, to take them. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Sally. Dean, you're up next. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, a couple, I have a couple morning. of questions. So the first one is, um, and I knew nothing about Hutt before, can you say a little bit about this mechanism? He's got a theory of uh, institutional transition, I guess, where he, you know, to bolster his argument that you don't want to transition from, you know, at least this particular uh, regime in South Africa mm -hmm. directly to one person, one vote. Um, and so I'd be curious what the mechanism is there. And then second, you, you hit it at the end, uh, the data sort of supports his worry, I guess, at least in the case of Mugabe. I wonder if, mm -hmm. if you have looked at sort of a, a larger sample of data to, mm -hmm. to tell us if we can, you know, confirm or refute or, or what, uh, Hutz, Hutz theory. So those are kind of two pronged question, thanks. Okay, certainly, thank you. So his theory of institutional transition is kind of Olson before Olson um, in that, you know, he, he argues, and, and so the book project, the, the, the tentative title is liberalism against racism. So we're kind of playing a little bit off of, of William Riker's work there. Um, you know, he argues that you, you, if you're going to have a peaceful transition, then you need people to buy in. Uh, you need to have at least some acquiescence to these sorts of changes or else everything sort of descends into chaos. Um, from the perspective of the 1960s, there are presumably pretty good reasons to think that an immediate transition from white domination to black domination or to, to black mass democratization in Africa is going to, is basically just gonna create a disaster. Um, he argues, he argues, and again, this is not, not based on any sort of, sort of racial theory or, or anything like that, but he's just, he's, he's saying that if we want to preserve what very little bits of European style liberalism exist in Africa, uh, and what very little bits of prosperity exist in Africa, then we're going to need to be gradual about it. And he argues for a qualified franchise based on property ownership or income or education requirements as a way of gradually expanding the franchise without turning societies, <clears throat> without turning societies completely upside down. One of the points that he notes is that uh, the migration flows that are happening in the 1960s from say Tanzania are from quote unquote liberated African countries to South Africa, where people are, you know, which, which, is, which is still under apartheid. So he, uh, he says that unless we're gonna treat, unless we're gonna treat large scale democratization as an end of itself, um, then we're gonna have to be a little bit more careful about, um, about how, we, how we think about making this transition. So he argues in the context of 20th century, in, the, in the, the context of say like World War II Britain, that um, continuity of expectations really, really matters a lot for purposes of getting people to buy into the legitimacy of the system. And he effect effectively argues for buy-offs and says, you know, just, just go ahead and you know, not to put too fine a point on it, just say, go ahead and, and, and buy off this group, buy off that group, buy off the other group. And the depredations on rights or the slight injustices or the it short run inefficiencies will be more than made up for by uh, better economic growth. It makes a more or less similar argument in the 1960s about South Africa saying that if, if this is what we have to do to get to a functional multiracial society, then in his humble opinion, it's worth it. Let me, let me follow up with that, if I may, that sure. does he say anything about the ability of government to say, to commit to a path, which is kind of what you're suggesting right. here. And, yeah. um, and that would be, of course, the worry of, of you know, different groups that, well, mm -hmm. yeah, they're not really going to commit to the final mm -hmm. outcome. How can we, you know, how can we make a deal um, yeah. that will generate that kind of commitment? Yeah, so this is actually one of the fascinating things about his correspondence with ZK Matthews. So, um, so Matthews, when he's he's going to, so Matthews was uh, prosecuted with Nelson Mandela in the treason trial in the 1950s, and is, is just a really fascinating character in his own right. And in the letters that Hutt writes to Matthews, he says, um, "You have a golden opportunity here as a, sort of a high-profile black African coming to the University of Cape Town." 
to speak at a white institution where there's a lot of foment about people people really wanting to, to, to make this, this movement this move forward, this would be a great platform for you to say we need these ironclad constitutional provisions to protect white rights to land, white rights to housing, or white, basically white rights to their stuff. Um, because you're not, and this is this again is Hutt's argument, he says you are not going to get nonviolent acquiescence to widespread democratization on the part of on the part of, of South African whites without exactly this point credible commitment to white property rights. And then Matthews, one of the interesting things that he says is, okay, well, yeah, that's true, but you know, you ask Africans how well credible commitments to property rights have worked out over the last uh, the last decade or so. So I mean, it's a really it's, it's just a really really fascinating discussion of exactly this sort of issue. Do we have other questions at this time? I have several I can throw out there. I'll go ahead and you all can uh, think okay. if you have uh, and any follow up questions too can can also be um, raised. So on so you, on page ten of your paper, you you all okay. you and Phil and Ilya mention this idea of the collective theory of discrimination, which is that mm -hmm. which is how, dealing with discrimination not according to this idea of the individual, which is such a public mm -hmm. choice approach to think about politics, but from the idea of the collective. Um, what makes Hutt think in terms of groups rather than individuals? Um, and does he, and uh, so there's a, this is a two-prong question. What makes him think of terms mm -hmm. of, in terms of groups rather than, than individuals? And two, does Hutt grapple with federalism in his work? Federalism, federalism, not that I've seen. So that's the easy one. Um, but then, yeah, so then the, the thinking in terms of groups, he argues and in fact, so Jennifer Roback has a handful of really interesting papers in the 1980s, building on Hutt specifically, in which she describes she describes racism as rent seeking. And Hutt argues in, in his work on uh, early 20th century unionization in South Africa that effectively racism is a means of uh, is a means of economizing on transaction costs for collective action. It's really really easy to identify members of the out group if the rent seeking coalition is defined as people who look like me. Um, and that basically is his argument for how and why people, why people tend to think about things in terms of groups. It's simply a relatively easy way to identify people who are part of the rent seeking coalition and people who are outside of the coalition. All right. Does that answer your question? It does. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't and you know I don't envy him being a white economist it, at at the time that he lived you know in, yeah. in such so yeah but I think he was grappling some really interesting problems and and trying to point mm -hmm. out trying yeah. to come to a consensus that sort of respected the human dignity of, of every person and and I, I'm curious so I'm, and of course you talk about how he mentions the market as this way of like mm -hmm. offering that. Um, when I hear the market, you know, especially talked in terms of public choice or even um, Austrian e economics, it's always presented as this idea that allows competition, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. But sometimes competition can be winner take all, which is a critique of right. like market system. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes I think of, okay, well, if it, if we're thinking of in terms of competition, then yes, we often end up in winner take all scenarios. But what if we also think of the market in terms of like options? All of a sudden, then markets could give us exit strategies from yeah. potentially bad situations. And obviously, mm -hmm. he's got to be thinking markets like political markets, not <laughs> not just um, uh, transactional, uh, mm -hmm. uh, not stuff stuff markets. Let me put it that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. You can respond to that. That's just me thinking out loud. But go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, um, so obviously, he's a, he's a big fan of, of the commercial space. And one of the reasons for his love for commerce is precisely because it, it provides exit options. If you, if you don't like a product, you exit. If you don't like a, uh, if you don't like a job, you exit. Um, and a lot of his criticism, uh, a lot of his criticism again of, of apartheid and South African labor market institutions is that they prevent exactly that. Or they prevent, um, they prevent entrepreneurs from acting in a manner that's consistent with what we expect, or at least what we think, is probably the as close as we can get to the underlying pattern of, of preferences and possibilities by passing laws saying, for example, um, 
so under the, the Mines and Works Act of, I think, 1924, you had to have a certain set of safety certificates and a certain set of licenses in order to operate what's basically an elevator in the mines. And it said explicitly, you're not allowed to have one of these unless you're white. So um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the things that does make this fascinating, again, is, is his, his insistence that you know, these rules benefit a very, very specific group, but again, to the, to the broader detriment of everybody else. Wow. Um, I see D Dean's hand again. Would you like to jump in, Dean? Yeah. So, since I don't know much about Hutt and, and uh, I know a reasonable amount about political economy, maybe you could um, tell us a little bit about how Hutt uh, is, is or is uh, is not viewed, um, you know, uh, along with some of the the larger scholars in the mid 20th century on political economy. Uh, is he considered relevant anymore? So put a little context in, you know, this is kind of a history yeah. of economic thought uh, conversation we're having. Um, or is he a lost, a lost uh, scholar in some sense? Yeah, so he's, um, he's obviously very, he's very well known kind of within the broad Austrian tradition, which is, is a very, very small, uh, small group. He's remembered and, and sort of regularly brought up as the guy who, who brought up or who, who popularized the, the, uh, the notion of consumer sovereignty. Um, I don't think that the political economy analysis that he's doing, I, I don't want to, one of, the, one of the things I, I do want to do, but don't want to do is to say, hey, he thought about all this stuff in very, very much the same way that, you know, Olson and Riker and all these other folks would, you know, in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but without saying he's anticipated all of this. Um, I think he's, he's, he's making very similar contributions that are probably under that are that are probably underappreciated and I think in particular underappreciated in light of the discussions that we've had over the last few decades um, about say post colonial uh, about transition in post colonial Africa and the development of um, the development of, of marketization and market institutions so uh, on one hand we want to sort of correct the historical narrative that Hutt like Hutt's a bad guy because of whatever but also say here are a lot of these insights, a lot of these things that we think are new that it turns out Hutt was thinking about in the 1940s and 50s. So there's kind of a little bit of both there. Um, if, I, if I may, so how much of it was that he was working in South Africa, which you know generated yeah. the source of ideas and not, he wasn't in England, he wasn't in the US, right. was he just isolated you know, in a less technologically connected world? Um, sometimes we see that sort of stuff. Yeah, that's one argument. Uh, and indeed people have, have said that's, that's probably why he's, people who have studied HUD have said that's probably one of the reasons why he's not a lot better known is that he spent most of his career in Cape Town, South Africa, publishing articles in like the, you know, the South African Journal of Economics and things like that. And he was, ed he was educated at the LSE. So he's, he's part of that club, but um, again, spent most of his career in yeah, on on the periphery of the of the profession, or on the periphery of, of where the, where the action was, he was appreciated. So Armin Alchin said, uh, apparently his his book, The Theory of Idle Resources, is one of the few truly great books in economics. So, uh, Dean, do you have any other follow up questions? Or you're good? Okay, Sali, um, please go ahead. Yes. Yeah, so just a follow up from you know, Art's response to my question. So Art, based on what you said, uh, uh, Hart does not consider uh, free markets uh, to be panacea to something that would solve mm, right. all the problems uh, related mm -hmm. to disenfranchisement. Uh, yeah. Particularly you said uh, in the United States, the state of uh, African-Americans. So Hart would not, mm -hmm. Uh, go to the extent of saying yes, this you know free market is a solution for their problems as well. Based on my understanding, Hutt has a, mo a lot more localized approach in terms of his uh, his uh, prescriptions. So, uh, could you please uh, elaborate more on this point? Yeah. So, so in the '60s, so so Hutt after he retires from the University of Cape Town, so he he decamps for the University of Virginia and spends two years there with with Buchanan and Tulloch and and Warren Nutter and and that whole that whole crowd. Um, 
in fact, he, he, writes, he writes an article to the South African Journal of Economics in 1966 that applies a lot of the insights that Buchanan and Tulloch bring to the table to problems of constitutionalism in South Africa. And then while he's in the United States, which is from the 19, the, let's see, the middle of the 60s through the end of his life, which is the middle of the 80s, he gives a lot of lectures at different places talking about um, institutional problems of civil rights and things like that. He, he's very, he, he believes that the, he's, he's, he's very much a, an exemplar of what Thomas Sowell would call the constrained vision. Uh, someone who believes that there, there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs and um, agrees that free markets are no panacea in that they're not gonna produce the multiracial paradise we'd like to live in, but they're the best of a lot of very, very imperfect options. Um, <clears throat> Again, he argues, he argues several times that consumers don't really care that much about who's making the stuff they're buying in terms of race, color, creed, et cetera. They just want to make sure they're getting a good deal. And um, he, is, he's of the view, he is of the view, though, that racial comedy is much more likely in a commercial society than it is under um, uh, in, in a society where uh, uh, political considerations are, are front and center. So we do have a follow-up question or um, can we turn to Scott now? All right, go for it, Scott. No, no I'm, I'm, yeah, I will let someone else take a question. Okay, sure. Scott, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, we'll, no, yeah. we'll do a quick one. I've, I've been enjoying the, the discussion. Okay. And then um, Andrew has a question, so. Um, yeah, okay. that's kind of where I was headed as far as where Angie was thinking about, you know, as well. Um, yeah, I, I was curious just to get your thoughts are. And thanks again for the presentation. Mm -hmm. really, sure, really thank you. Helpful and, and well done. Yeah. Um, you know, I, you. I was trying to get, trying to wrap, wrap my right mind around this a little bit as well, because I'm not as familiar as I should be, frankly, with his work. And I've done a little bit of research on, you know, polycentric, you know, property rights mm -hmm. regimes around the world that are very culturally relative, you know, and nested mm -hmm. in different communities, whether it's, you know, more common property systems or private property systems, yep. et cetera. Um, and that, you know, that, that whole obviously arena uh, has only been better recognized, mm -hmm. you know, in the last, you know, we could argue whatever, you know, 30, 40 or so mm -hmm. years. And I'm wondering if you could reflect on what you feel like um, he would have thought, you know, of this, of this, you know, appreciation for the, the diversity of property rights arrangements and how they can lead to various you know, types of community-led economic growth. I think that'd be kind of interesting. And and, and as Angie's uh, point, I pointed out there in the chat as well, I'd love if you wouldn't mind just taking a couple of minutes to kind of reflect on how you see this piece of the puzzle, the book that you're working on kind of fitting in, in terms of where, where you see your overall, you know, analysis heading and, and, what, and what some of the implications are, right? Um, of your of your digging in of this research, not only for you know sustainable development in Africa, but even even contemporary yeah. U.S. politics, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah. if you'd like to take any of those, you know, bites of the apple, please feel free. And, and thanks again. Sure, sure. Um, so my, my so I believe with a probability of about like 0. 0.6 or 0. 0.7 that while Hutt was not a paternalist or colonialist or anything like that, I think he he was. He, he wanted to see Africa westernized. So I, I'm not sure that he would have sort of fully appreciated polycentric on the ground, bubbled up institutions with like, in, like Lynn Ostrom would. Um, I, I haven't really seen much where he explains that. His, he, he's very clearly of the view, I think, that, that white, white South Africans trying to run black South Africans' lives is a terrible idea. Um, it's, I, I think he doesn't, he, he, He's, he's very, very skeptical of, of colonialism, very skeptical of domination. He's, I think, saying, look, for whatever, for better or for worse, this is the world we live in. How do we get from the status quo to something a little bit better? Um, in terms of where this fits, in terms of where this fits very broadly, we have, um, so my co-authors and I have a paper that should appear in the Independent Review at some point this year on some of the constitutional as aspects. Oh, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> And of course, we're preparing to submit this paper soon, we hope. We have a draft of the book manuscript that's a couple hundred pages long now. We're going to be looking for a publisher soon. Uh, and I'm using, I'm, using, I'm using draft very, very generously. We have, we have a lot of words in a document um, that at least sort of form something kind of almost resembling a cohesive whole. 
And um, another one of the things that really got me thinking about this is the literature on capitalism and slavery. Um, so just to get to kind of Salih's question here uh, from, from earlier, um, I decided about a year ago, I said, okay, I'm gonna spend the next 10 years of my life like studying this whole capitalism and slavery literature and seeing what the link is. And then Phil Magnus, my co-author on this project, handed me a bunch of documents he gotten from digging in Hutt's personal papers at Stanford. And that that's where part of this kind of came from. Um, <clears throat> I think where this matters for understanding development in Africa or understanding transition in the United States is in saying simply as a matter as a matter of kind of practical institutional design and implementation, we can't start with what our ideal world would look like and then say, okay, how do we get there? Or how, how would we construct a perfect world? We have to start from the status quo and say, what are the, what are the least disruptive ways to get from here to there? Um, I, this, this reminds me, I think, of, of like the reparations debate, for example. So um, uh, a lot of that, I think, is, is proceeding on, on, and this is this is perhaps valuable to do, like notions of abstract justice, which are important to consider. I've said before, you know, if you, uh, I, if, so just to just use a, an example here. So I, I learned years ago, to my great shame, that one of my ancestors owned a slave named Chloe. And I, I would believe that if Chloe's, answer, Chloe's descendants can be, can be identified and bring suit against me, then we're probably, we probably owe them something because it, it can be shown that you know, there's this very specific crime committed by my ancestor against their ancestors. Um, wholesale redistributions and things like that. And this is where I think Hutt would, Hutt would ask about this credible commitment problem. It's like, okay, if, if we're going to redistribute all the wealth, if we're going to redistribute everything right now, what's to say we don't redistribute again, you know, at some point in the future when our moral theory changes? And then I think Hutt would also say, but even, even, even kind of moving beyond that, that is sort of ignoring the broader question, which I, I, don't, I don't recall anywhere where he cites Hutt specifically, or Hutt, he cites Coe specifically, but saying, look, the, the, the important point is, is credible commitment to property rights, whatever they happen to be, so that we can have you know, exchange of production as opposed to a constant, constant battle over rights that are, that are perpetually up for grabs. So th those, those, I think, are some of the, the contemporary lessons that we would take from Hive. So I've written a handful of pieces for AIER, just kind of, you know, 750 to 1,000 words kinds of Here's something Hutt said, and here's why it's cool that you might find might find useful. Yeah, that'd be great. No, please do share. Thanks. Oh, sure. Yep. Um, no, thank you, Art. Does anybody do we have other questions? Because I have I have another I have another one. It's kind of hard, <laughs> but I think you can take it. Sure. Right? Hey. So we're living in the day where we're asking, like, why should we listen to to white guys? Why should we listen to white men talk about? <laughs> about economic justice and you know political freedom right so why should we listen to hot you know <laughs> well okay so there's the uh uh you know my 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 answer part of my answer is because we're grown-ups right i mean like and, and that's that's not you know um uh, referring to people's skin color or or whatever saying like you're wrong because of whatever demographic category you fit into, like this, this is very childish. Like this is not the way that that a a conversation among adults would proceed. Um, a second a second reason, kind of reaching out to people who who may not agree with that perspective, would just be to say that you know here's a guy who said some very very important things about post colonial transition in South Africa in the middle of the 20th century, and who has very specifically been sort of tragically misread and, mis and misinterpreted as, you know, just another dead white guy by some people who want to, who, who, who presumably in, in good faith really want to understand how this is going on. So um, those would be kind of my answers to why why, why, why read yet another, or why, why emphasize the contributions of yet another dead white male. We have a question from, thank you. <laughs> thank you for taking on the challenge of, of that question. Sure. Um, we have a question from Dean. 
Please okay. go ahead. Thanks. So um, following up on that a little bit. So he's writing at the time, you know, and Olson um, and a lot of you know other political scientists, uh, political economists are mentioning our uh, Buchanan and so forth, Riker, mm -hmm. all this public choice movement and sort of uh, positive political theory is, is happening. Is he interacting with them at all? Or, and I mean, I, I know apartheid was not oh, yeah. on the table as a discussion in the 50s, 60s mm -hmm. and 70s in the US really. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But is he interacting with them and how is he received uh, uh, you know, among that group? Um, mm -hmm. Oh yeah, he's, he's literally, He's literally right across the hall or like right down the hall from Buchanan and Tulloch at Virginia, 65 and 66. So um, I, I, you know, there's, I, I imagine there's a lot of really interesting conversation going on at lunch during that time. Um, there's not, from what we can tell, a really big Buchanan hut correspondence that we've, that we've been able to find. Um, what I do want to look into at some point, this is this is kind of moving moving a little bit down the road, would be um, sort of what in the administrative records at the University of Virginia might we be able to find about Hutt's short term appointment at uh, at UVA. Um, what is what potentially has been overlooked in the Buchanan papers that would speak to exactly this sort of question? Uh, the Buchanan papers, unfortunately, I think are closed for processing until 2023. Um, Hutt's papers are at Stanford, and I want to get out there at some point and dig around a little bit more in uh, his correspondence and see kind of what's what, what's happening in, in this sort of foment of, of the development of the Public Choice Society. And uh, there are, I, I asked a student to look into this, and I don't think there's actually any correspondence between Hutt and Olson that we were able to find. but. Um, He's 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 very much like he, he's not right at the center of the story, but he's there in 1965 and 66 as the Public Choice Society is being formed, as the, the journal is is getting ready to be launched. Um, I think he's attracted to UVA in part by um, by reading the calculus of consent. So uh, I don't want to again. I, I, I'm not sure I want to tell like a forgotten founder story about how like HUD is the key to understanding all the stuff, but um, I think he's 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 important enough to take another look at. What about interaction with Downs and Olson and, and those those scholars that, uh, who are writing, you know, the major treatises at the time on understanding uh, politics? Yeah, I'll have to look. Um, but I know. Let me see here. Hold on. Uh, Uh, okay, like, yeah, I, I don't have any anything like immediately at hand to really dig into. With a, I could go get my Kindle, but um, he, I think I remember him citing downs a couple of times. I, I don't know exactly how he develops that though. But that's a really, really good question. And I'm gonna look into that a little bit more. Okay. Well, we are a couple of minutes before the hour. Um, our, we never asked if you wanted to stay a few minutes longer um, in case you know the conversation continues. Um, sure, happy to. Okay, um, and of course, um, I'll let Scott wrap up before we do that in the last minute that we have, um, and then I'll stay on the line for a few more minutes and you, anybody else can as well. So over to you, Scott. Of course, of course. Well, hey, first, everybody, please join me in thanking Art for his excellent presentation and the chance to discuss your paper. Thank you. Yes, yes, no, very much. And um, that was excellent. And, and just as a reminder, everybody, at 145 Eastern, for those who are able to, we will have that special IASC and workshop panel at the, uh, for the main IASC conference this week. Um, no research series on Wednesday, recall, but looking forward uh, to a wonderful colloquium next Monday uh, when we are going uh, to be joined by Ruth. Uh, mine's in Nick on International Food and Policy Research Institute. Her paper will be Migration and Gender Dynamics of Irrigation Governance in Nepal. Um, so happy again, Indigenous Peoples Day. Very relevant topic um, for today that we were discussing. And thanks so much again. As a reminder, and thanks, uh, thanks Thank to you. Jamie for 
for nominating um, the speaker today. And also for those who are able to stay on, let's continue the discussion for a few more minutes, okay? All right. so thanks so much again, Art.